Hello, and welcome to today's panel discussion on career paths that make a difference. I'm Tim Marshall, Deputy Vice Chancellor of the College of Design and Social Context here at RMIT. Now, before we kick off today's discussion, I would like to acknowledge the people of the Woiwurrung and the Boonwurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations on whose unceded lands we conduct the business of the university. RMIT respectfully acknowledges their ancestors and elders, past, present, and emerging. And while we conduct our work remotely, I want to pay my respects to the, to the wider unceded lands of this nation. Now at RMIT, we understand that the education sector plays a vital role in creating a more sustainable future together with the world-class research that we conduct. In 2015, the United Nations developed the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, which is a framework to address the complex effort to achieve environmental sustainability for our planet. And it includes a fulsome understanding of sustainability, i.e. it's inclusive of peace, social and economic inclusion, cultural and political engagement, and a sense of general well-being for people now and into the future. There are 17 goals in total, which represent an urgent call for action by every country on Earth. They recognize that ending poverty and other deprivations must go hand in hand with strategies that improve health and education, reduce inequality, and spur economic growth, all while tackling climate change and working to preserve our natural world. In other words, addressing one cannot come at the expense of another. Now, in its third year, the Times Higher Education University impact ratings, coming from the Times newspaper in London, uh, were designed to showcase progress against these SDGs by measuring a university's environmental, social, and economic impact. In 2021, RMIT ranked third overall in the, in the world and second in the world for its efforts to reduce inequality. So third overall across all 17 SDGs and second to reduce inequality. A remarkable achievement, I hope you would agree. So to be ranked as one of the top global universities in this area is testament obviously to the passion and dedication of our RMIT community. And through our innovative teaching, learning and research, we've made a genuine commitment to tackling some of the biggest societal and environmental challenges of our time. So, with this in mind, today we've assembled an expert panel of RMIT academics and researchers to, to discuss some of the ways that RMIT is helping students to develop the skills, talent, and passion to drive positive change across all 17 SDGs, regardless of the field of study that you're in. And so, to get things going, let's meet our fantastic panel. Panelists? Thank you, Tim. Uh, my name's Jock Gilbert. I'm a landscape architect and academic in the School of Architecture and Urban Design here at RMIT University. And I'm also program manager of the Bachelor of Landscape Architectural Design and co-chair of our School Architecture Urban Design Reconciliation Action Committee, which we call our Ngulu Committee. And I'm looking forward to chatting with you later on. That's it. Thanks, Tim. Um, to introduce myself, I'm Professor Kit Wise. I'm a professor of fine art and very proud to be Dean of the School of Art here at RMIT. Great, thank you. Hello, I'm Professor Ian Devere. I'm the Associate Dean for Industrial Design. As an educator, I'm interested in the power of design to make a positive contribution to society and I'm very happy to join you today to discuss ways that industrial design can make an impact in response to social and environmental issues. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Tim. I'm Professor Tanya Broadley, I'm the Dean of the School of Education and an Education Academic at RMIT. Looking forward to our conversation tonight. Thanks, Tanya. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr Kay Quek. I'm a lecturer in Global Studies uh, here at RMIT. I teach mostly into our Bachelor of International uh, Studies degree and I'm looking forward to uh, tonight's event. Great. Thanks. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Dr Ben Cook and I'm the Program Manager of the Bachelor of Environment and Society. Um, my research interests are around uh, the social dimensions of nature conservation um, and I look forward to ch chatting with you later. Fantastic. So I think you can see that what a <laughs> wonderfully diverse and interesting college design and social context really is. Uh, so just before we get started, I'll remind viewers that we'll have about 15 minutes at the end of our panel discussion to go over any questions from the audience. You can submit questions at any time using the Q&A tool on the right of your screen. 
and we'll do our best to answer as many as possible at the end. So we look forward to your questions. Okay, first up is Ian, who you've just heard from, uh, Ian in industrial design. Now, Ian, industrial design has historically been seen as a discipline interested in mass manufacturing of products. But over the last decade or, decade or so, it's been radically reimagined by people like yourself. Ensuring sustainable consumption and production patterns is the 12th sustainable development goal, and one that's particularly important to a discipline that uses the resources to design and create product, products and services, and potentially creates waste. So what are some of the projects that our industrial design students are working on that may contribute to achieving this SDG goal? So over to you, Ian, thank you. Thank, thanks, Tim. The world's facing huge social health and environmental challenges, and industrial designers are really well equipped to respond to these. Industrial design, as you said, is not just about designing products for mass manufacture. There are many new and emerging fields of practice for industrial designers, including service design, experience design, social innovation, design for health and well-being, and design for sustainability. With regard to SDG goal number 12, sustainable consumption, for example, every year, an estimated one third of all food produced ends up rotting at the bins of consumers and retailers or spoiling due to poor transportation or harvesting practices. Now, RMIT Industrial Design is a lead research partner in the Fight Food Waste Cooperative Research Centre, where we bring our technical knowledge and our human centered design expertise to help realise sustainable solutions. Recently, Madison Ryder, an industrial design graduate, won the Next Generation Award um, at the Good Design Awards for her Lettuce Eat project, where she actually repurposed scrap lettuce leaves from supermarket waste to make a biodegradable and rigid material suitable for packaging and tableware. The other main focus for industrial design is social innovation. While sustainability is embedded throughout our program, we work closely with healthcare organisations and government agencies on projects that aim to improve health and wellbeing and contribute to global communities. An example is Ryan Tilley, who won both the Good Design Award and the James Dyson Award for his final year project, Gecko Tracks, which is an amazing assistive technology product now in production, which enables a wheelchair to go on a beach, promoting independent living. We have the Safest by Design Initiative, which has been working with the cities of Melbourne and Barcelona on projects that make our cities smarter and safer, especially for women at night. And this semester, we're collaborating with WorkSafe, and students are developing solutions to enable an aging workforce across a range of different industries. For example, we have students that are looking at mental health in the construction industry, um, how we can avoid musculoskeletal injury and in healthcare home visits, and also how we can use assistive technology to overcome the impact of arthritis in the manufacturing sector. So very diverse type of projects. But all of these social projects, they may have service design, strategy, awareness campaign, and or behavior change outcomes rather than just products. But they all have impact. And that's really the core of what we do in the industrial design program. We're working in industry collaborations on meaningful projects that have potential to contribute to societal wellbeing. Fantastic. And for those that don't know, the Dyson Award is probably one of the most prestigious industrial design awards uh, on the planet right now. So that's the right. work. Yeah, thank you. So, Tanya. On to you. 9% of children around the world in grades one through eight fell below the minimum reading proficiency levels in 2020. Now, the aim of SDG number four is to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and to promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. What kind of impact do these literacy levels have on our communities and how is the School of Education at RMIT contributing to ensuring equitable and quality education for all? Thanks. Interesting question, Tim. The impact of literacy levels on communities is really an interesting provocation. We know that literacy education is a fundamental foundation to all other learning. It's what we sometimes consider a precondition of learning. One of the really important roles of classroom teachers from early childhood through to secondary education, which we offer in our School of Education at RMIT, is to ensure their students progress through the different levels of education with a strong grasp of literacy to provide them with a toolkit for life. Now, when people think about what literacy is, many revert to thinking it's a skill to understand written language, whether that's a digital blog on your iPad or a good old fashioned novel. 
I like to think of it as a liter literacy is a superpower, Tim. It can position every individual to reach their potential in whatever they choose to do and however they want to participate in society. So when some people think about literacy, they often think about learning to read and write at school. But if we are thinking about here today, literacy is important to make a difference to people's lives and create social change. So Tim, there's a much wider conversation than just minimum proficiency levels on standardised testing. We know that literacy levels produce greater social outcomes and trust in others in society. We know that being able to navigate the world outside of school really relies on this. So just to be able to do your banking or fill out your forms at the doctors, read information about your rental or housing contract, really important life tasks rely on this. We know that communication is based in literacy and that for people to communicate and engage with really important activities like influencing political, health and social change for our country and the world, this is needed. Our education system in Australia fosters creativity and critical thinking to support these outcomes. We've got some really exciting research happening at RMIT, which is funded by the Australian Government, in upskilling teachers and pre-service teachers in how to foster creativity and creative thinking across all the education lifespan. We're seeing a global increase in the need for creative skills and capacities, which is well evidenced in our national curricular changes as well as the new PISA test alongside literacy and numeracy for creative thinking, which actually commences this year. Our creative agency research group is working in an interdisciplinary way that spans across schools and sectors, really to contribute to this exciting space. And we've got a range of fabulous academics and researchers in the school working on a wide range of social factors. And some are really looking at those broader wicked problems, Tim, how do we equip students and young people to thrive in an interconnected world where they need to understand and appreciate different perspectives and worldviews? They need to interact respectfully with others and take responsible action towards sustainability and collective wellbeing. So Tim, all of these topics really matter for our wider society. And in the School of Education at RMIT, we have a suite of programs that prepare our graduates for a diverse range of contexts for becoming educators in cities and regional and remote communities all over Australia. So the opportunities to contribute to society and truly make a difference each and every day in the lives of others can be achieved through our programs at RMIT, Tim. Fantastic, thank you, Tanya. And I think uh, you'd agree that it's vital for a democracy as well to have a literate population that can fully engage. Um, and. And there's no better place, I would think, for, for you to be teaching creative approaches to education than in design and social context, where you're surround, you're surrounded by design and art and performing arts and other creative endeavours, right? Absolutely. Critical for the work we're doing. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Okay. Quick reminder um, that our live Q&A tool is open, so please do submit your questions in the chat function on the right, and our panelists will try and answer them at the end of the discussion, as we mentioned earlier. Okay, so moving on indeed to the School of Art and Kit Wise. Kit, art represents one of the few areas in our society where people can come together to share an experience, even if they see the world in radically different ways. When I went to art school, uh, and I imagine when you went to art school, art was not really seen as an agent of the kind of change we're talking about today. And this has changed really dramatically over the, last, over the past years. The capacity to create an imaginary of a world that we are seeking to make is fundamental. Art and other forms of cultural expression are venues for different perspectives on what is to be on this planet at this moment in history, what it is to be on, on this planet at this moment in history for conflicting worldviews to be embraced as essential in our ability to move to a new place together as a society. For example, as a place for First Nations, no, for, for, sorry, for example, as a place for First Nations ways of knowing and being to be reasserted as critical, as critical as science is to our collective future. So to that, uh, Tanya just spoke about to us about SDG 4, and one of the targets within this goal is to promote a culture of peace and nonviolence, global citizenship, and appreciation of cultural diversity. How do you think art, and particularly art education at RMIT, helps to promote these ideas? Thanks. Thanks very much, Tim, and um, <clears throat> it's such a rich discussion this evening already. Um, I would pick up on those wonderful points by my colleague, Professor Tanya, um, broadly just 
pre previously in terms of creativity and criticality being fundamental to our future. <clears throat> and we hear a lot about the industries of the future, um, uh, industries 10 years away, not currently existing, but being predicated on being able to imagine new possibilities um, and test existing models. And, and Tim, I think that that's the core of what, what art as a discipline can contribute. Um, it's a space for imagination and it's a safe space for sharing difference. The richness of what individuals and diverse cultures can create and share is always incredibly exciting. And those intersections drive future ideas and future imaginaries, as you say. But finding a place where um, difference can be celebrated and respected is, I think, a really special and unique role that, that art can manifest. And so sharing, enabling difference, and then enabling collaboration are the values that we believe in very strongly in the School of Art. Um, and how do we explore this? Um, you mentioned the value of First Nations knowledges, um, which we would absolutely uh, profoundly agree with. Um, recognizing, celebrating and, and learning about those knowledges is now foundational in our programs. Uh, we also have opportunities to learn from partners in our region. Um, the School of Arts fortunate to have had a 20 year partnership with the Hong Kong Art School, um, sharing students and learnings uh, across uh, cultures um, for, for a considerable length of time. And we're now working with RMIT Vietnam similarly. But, but I take your point around um, how can art promote peace um, and global citizenship? Um, we're familiar with art, if you like, generating beautiful forms, whether that's an extraordinary photograph or a magnificent piece of jewellery or painting. But as you say, in the recent times, the last decade or two, artists don't want to make just make beautiful things. They want to make the world itself beautiful. And so finding spaces again where new ideas can be promoted, um, communication through visual forms or sound um, being, being made possible. There's a quote I, I always share with my students um, and, and colleagues um, that came out of the traumas of World War II, that um, ideas aren't dangerous, thinking itself is dangerous. Thinking itself has the capacity to change the world. And I like to think that a school of art is a hub for new thinking, for that creativity and criticality others have talked about. I could go on all night um, uh, and, and we should pass to others, but um, I, I would acknowledge just two projects from the school that I think exemplify this. Um, one is work that our third year students in photography do um, based uh, at the Collingwood Yards Hub um, in just outside of the CBD in Melbourne, where our students collaborate with members of the community, um, year 11 and 12 students, uh, people from migrant backgrounds um, around the discipline of photography, teach them what they know and learn in turn. Uh, and and, and that, that sharing, um, that delivery of a discipline in the world, in the real world is, is something we're very excited by. And, and finally, um, the role of art, um, not just in galleries uh, and museums, but also in spaces such as hospitals. Um, we had an extraordinary opportunity with the Peter McCallum Centre uh, a year or so ago, pre-COVID, to run um, a festival, um, and we called it the Hand Festival, where um, we celebrated the handmade, um, we celebrated touch, connection, um, we celebrated what it is to use your hands. And so there were artworks, there were art processes, and there was even physical contact um, between some of the patients there and, and artists and members of our, our school. And so um, that, that opportunity of art to use not just its ideas, but its methods to help, I think is, is very exciting. Thank you very much, Tim. Fantastic. Thanks, Kit. And uh, you're far too modest to say it, but I'll say it on your behalf that you are Dean of the number one art school in Australia. Um, and uh, I think one of the top in the world by, by independent rankings. So that's uh, a fantastic achievement.
um, as many of our programs and schools in DSC are very highly ranked uh, across the country and across the world. Okay, so, Kay, moving on to you. Uh, STG, and to remind people, you're the, you're the program leader of Global Studies. Um, SDG number five is to, quote, achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls, end of quote. But gender, gender parity remains stubbornly far off all around the world. Obviously, the tragedy unfolding in Afghanistan is a stark and extreme reminder of this forward and backward movement on achieving equality. But nevertheless, uh, throughout the world, this is still remains an issue. As of 2020, women make up 36.3% of local governments and only 25.6% of national parliaments in terms of representatives, meaning women are not fully and effectively participating at all levels of decision making in an equitable way. So given this context, Kate, uh, community developers a big focus for international studies, I know, and how are the students in the, of this discipline involved in meeting the targets of SDG 5? Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Uh, look, there are so many different ways that our students in international studies are involved in advancing not only SDG 5, but um, most, if not all, of the Sustainable Development Goals. Our program is very much focused on issues of international development, uh, poverty alleviation, uh, effective cross-cultural communication, uh, as well as issues of, of global security, diplomacy and human rights. So as you can imagine, our students are, are highly active in trying to advance the sustainable development goals. But to speak uh, specifically to Sustainable Development Goal 5, which uh, provides targets relating to gender equality, there are some really uh, wonderful uh, concrete examples of the ways in which our students are, are active in promoting this particular goal. Um, the best example perhaps comes in the form of one of our capstone courses, which is called Global Internship. In our internship course, our students uh, undertake a placement with an organisation relating to international affairs, uh, and they have the opportunity to really integrate and combine their academic learning with work-based learning, um, when they have the opportunity to gain insights into how organisations relevant to our field uh, not only operate, but how they uh, deal with challenges that they face in, in a real world context. Mm. Now, uh, back in that wonderful mystical time when we could all travel overseas and go to other countries, we had uh, students placed all over the world uh, doing incredible internships with United Nations agencies, in uh, embassies and consulate offices, in the private sector, and as you can imagine, across a lot of non-government organisations. And while some of our students have, uh, have been able to still do placements with organisations based overseas, I've noticed in the last 18 months a great number of students um, have identified organisations right here in Australia and, and indeed in Melbourne who are doing incredible work advancing gender equality. Uh, to give you a couple of examples, we've had students placed at uh, an organisation called Chalk Circle. Chalk Circle does um, uses rather uh, uh, evidence-based research to address uh, the harms of gender stereotypes. And they do that by creating community development programs and education programs that they roll out in schools. And so our students have been able to draw on their incredible research skills, on the breadth of their communication skills, um, and their familiarity with up-to-date research in this area to not only contribute to the creation of these programs, but to actually be involved in their implementation within in our community. We've had students placed at a very small but very important organisation right here in Melbourne called Project Respect. Project Respect supports women who have um, experienced exploitation in the sex industry. That includes women who've been victims of sex trafficking. Our students have worked in policy development roles, in donor networking positions, um, as project officers to support the work of, of that organisation. One last example um, of, of student placements that we've had a lot of actually lately um, is the organisation called Sisterworks that some of you might have heard of um, because they do incredible work and they gained a little bit of fame uh, this time last year when the face mask mandate came in in Melbourne and we were all scurrying and frantically trying to buy face masks. 
Our SisterWorks is a social enterprise that supports refugee, um, asylum seeker and migrant women in Australia. Um, it seeks to uh, help the women upskill, for instance, in creating crafts and um, in gaining uh, economic independence, really, uh, upon migration to Australia. Our, our students have been involved in, a, in, a array, in an array of roles with SisterWorks. Uh, so through experience such as, as these, um, the students tell us that they not only gain um, industry contacts and connections, they not only gain uh, career opportunities because many of the students have stayed on with these organisations and, and gained full-time employment with them post-graduation, uh, but the point that the students often make to us is that um, they they always tell us just how relevant what we're learning in the classroom is uh, in that real world context. And it's a theme that our graduates in international studies pick up on as well. We're really fortunate to have um, a really strong alumni community in international studies. And one of the messages that's often fed back to us through our graduate community is that um, the, the skills that our, our students develop in our program they're not only relevant to addressing a wide range of global challenges, but often our graduates tell us that the degree empowered them to, uh, with a skill set rather, um, for jobs that didn't exist at the time that they graduated, that the degree has been so forward looking, they still draw on it even in, uh, in uh, situations that we couldn't Im imagine and envisage when they did their degree. Um, so that's some of the ways in which international studies uh, addresses the sustainable development goals. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, that was, and uh, you are reminding me at least that to uh, say something about our global. Um, during the course of the, uh, of the study of the people that are attending this evening, they'll, I'm sure, have the opportunity to travel again. Um, we do have two campuses in Vietnam, in, in uh, Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, in Saigon, and uh, we also have uh, a base in Europe and a plethora of international partner institutions where students can take study abroad in various ways, which is obviously very important to many students' uh, educational experience. So thanks for pointing that out as well. Um, okay, so last but not least, Jock. Now, Jock, the average global share of urban areas allocated to open public spaces and streets is only 16% which falls short of the target set by the Sustainable Development Goal number 11 to make, to quote, make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. With a rapidly urbanising world, uh, cities and their buildings, interiors and landscapes are going to be critical to sustainability and well-being. All professions taught in your school at, uh, in architecture and urban design. Buildings, as we know, account for a very large portion of our carbon emissions. Interiors have a great impact on health and landscape on our mental well-being. So how do you address these issues in your programs? Thanks, Jock. Thanks, Tim. Yes, uh, a wonderful question. And they are indeed big issues. And uh, thanks for a wonderful conversation, everyone, thus far. Um, look, Tim, we do address these questions across all our programs in the School of Architecture and Urban Design. And I have to say, uh, it can get a little bit discomforting. It's easy to lose a sense of hope and perspective in the face of some of these issues and the gravity of them. But I can say that across all of our programs in the school, we do invest in our students what we get a sense of, a sense of hope, and also importantly, to invest in them the opportunity to develop tools which allow responses to those issues. Uh, in particular, for those of us involved in the profession of landscape architecture at RMIT, we say that we work with many of the things that we love the most as human beings. Plants, streets, gardens, parks, plazas, seasons, rivers, coastlines, communities, memories. And we work with those elements in order to address many of the things that are inherent in your question. The things that we fear the most as human beings, climate change, environmental degradation, loss of biodiversity in the natural world, disruption, possibly pandemic disruption, and of course, drab, uniform and exclusive public spaces. And we believe very firmly across the School of Architecture and Urban Design that inclusive design in Australia begins fundamentally with the recognition that we are designing on unceded lands and those lands belong to our First Nations peoples wherever we are. And in a country that enjoys over 60,000 years of living culture, 
we engage students actively in exploring just exactly what our cities will look like when we do engage with design as an act of reconciliation. And it's an act of reconciliation that we see supports Indigenous sovereignty and self-determination. So Tim, all of our programs in the school offer design learning through what we call design studios. And this is a way of learning design by doing design through engagement with real world issues and through engagement with the very community groups that are impacted by those issues, as well, of course, as with the broader design of built environment professions and practices. Our research and specialist knowledge within the school provides the tools, the guidance, the support, and the ability to engender knowledge for our future design practitioners as they move through those studios. And Tim, this is supported specifically in this sense by our on-country design studio offerings. And through these, we continue to partner with traditional knowledge holders and community groups. And these include rich relationships with the Bunwurrung Foundation and Nawi Dr. Carolyn Briggs in Melbourne, in Nam, the Karei Wurrung community and Uncle Lenny Clark in Western Victoria, the Culpra Millie Aboriginal Corporation and the Pierce family on Barkindji country up in Western New South Wales, who are having a terrible time just at the moment. And the amazing Daniel Rose Gularabaloo mob in the West Kimberley region of Western Australia, among others. And these partnerships, Tim, have matured into reciprocal relationships that support the sharing of knowledge. So our students share these relationships and then they make lifelong relationships that transcend the classroom, if you like. Students keep going back to work on projects which make real differences to people's lives and they are engaged and invested in the relationships that nurture those lives. We're always on country in Australia, Tim, as you know, we're welcomed onto country and into country to learn, to engage with and through country and the relationships and responsibilities with coming, which come with that learning. So as we accept the invitation into country and onto country, and we do understand that responsibility, it gives us an insight into the many rich benefits to all of us as Australians of people of the world of such an approach. This has the potential, we say, to improve the well-being of people and to create places, cities, suburbs, regional places that ultimately mean much, much more to all of us. Because, as we know, we are all connected to and through country. So our students are then able to understand the positive environmental impacts of design outcomes derived this way. And we say and we understand and our students begin to understand that design generated this way often has a lighter environmental footprint. It requires fewer natural resources in construction. It's often responsive to our human needs and importantly is recognisably of its place. So I hope that's answered the question, Tim, and uh, thank you very much. I've really enjoyed the conversations and um, look forward to some questions from the audience. Wonderful, thank you, Jock. That was uh, fantastically informative. Um, now I got a little ahead of myself. Um, we now have Ben, Ben Cook, who actually is, his program is probably most squarely focused on the topic of the evening because uh, he runs the Environment and Society program. So Ben, uh, a recent report that came out, uh, that's now known as Code Red, by, that was issued by an intergovernmental panel on climate change, has outlined how human activity is changing the climate in unprecedented and potentially irreversible ways. The report warns of increasing the extreme heat waves, droughts and flooding, and a key temperature limit being broken in just over a decade. And I think we can all see that starting to emerge in our climate now. The report is a code red for humanity, quote unquote, said the UN chief. Um, but scientists say a, a catastrophe can be avoided if the, if the world takes immediate action. Uh, the emphasis being on action. So how are our graduates prepared to be part of taking this action? Thanks, Tim. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate that. Um, and no worries at all. It's a, it's definitely a save the best to last situation. We all know how that works. Um, so thanks, um, everyone, for, for being here. And um, absolutely right. It, it is a really concerning um, development, but, but also one that, you know, we have known about for a long period of time. And I think that's something that, that we really do acknowledge in the Environment Society program, that as you say, it is about preparing students to undertake a range of actions, um, and we underpin that with a particular pro approach um, when we engage with issues like climate change, um, which is to acknowledge that environmental issues are fundamentally social and political issues. 
Um, as I said, you know, the science has been pretty settled for a long period of time. Um, so what we really need to do and what our focus is about is preparing students um, for engaging in those kinds of policy and community and organisational roles that are about turning these kinds of ideas um, into action. Um, and I guess to pick up on a vital theme uh, and, and a strong theme from, from tonight, um, we also teach that First Nations land sovereignty and self-determination is fundamental to climate action. Uh, you mentioned the IPCC report. Um, IPCC recently partnered with another big UN body uh, that looks at biodiversity to reinforce that increasing um, and consolidating First Nations ownership and management over land is, is a critical part of this broader cause. Um, but in terms of what our students are up to at the moment, and our former students too, uh, we have students who are heavily involved in, in policy and advocacy uh, for things like offshore wind farms in Victoria, which are a really big, interesting development at the moment, um, working both inside and outside government for those types of initiatives. Um, and those same people have been working towards um, getting uh, Victoria and Australia more broadly committed to cleaner energy targets. Um, and being critical to those, those efforts as well. Um, and I think fundamentally too, we have people who, who um, are working uh, at developing and implementing their skills in a range of different ways in their communities, um, in, in a range of contexts too, from the household to the neighbourhood, uh, to implement some really interesting, uh, sustainable uh, uh, and equitable activities for all. Um, and, and that's another big thing that we focus on too, is um, we're big on ways of, of working with communities to support, to, to be supported at all levels, to make substantive change. Um, so right now we've got students working um, in placement programs uh, with organisations like Cultivating Community and the Banksia Gardens Community Services, um, which are about urban agriculture, urban greening, community engagement at the local level, um, communities in the city, a range of different contexts, um, because these are the types of initiatives that um, are critical for affecting the kinds of structural change we need. We need to be able to bring people along with us in really engaging ways and, and students really revel in the opportunity to sort of apply this idea that, well, if we are to address environmental issues, we fundamentally have to see them as, as social, social, cultural and, and political as well. Um, but we also have students working in a range of um, more traditional roles. We have a lot of graduates going into the public sector, working in areas um, like for Melbourne Water, uh, the Country Fire Authority, some really interesting projects helping communities get prepared uh, and to adapt to um, a, a changing climate future that means things like uh, bushfire preparedness at, at a range of scales um, and, and people working in large and small um, businesses too in the private sector. Um, excitingly too, our program has recently been accredited by the um, Environment Inst Institute of Australia and New Zealand, which is the peak professional environmental um, organisation for, for Australia as a, as a program, a multi-vocational vocational program that prepares students um, incredibly well for the types of critical roles that I'm talking about that combine these social and environmental issues. And it's now uh, one of only two uh, programs like that um, in Australia. So um, we're a, uh, an interesting and diverse team in the, in the Environment Society program. Um, along with our, our colleagues in the, in the urban and um, regional planning program too. Um, we have a, a lead author in the IPCC amongst us uh, in the teaching group. We have people working, that's Professor Lauren Rickards. We have people working in all sorts of areas from urban sustainability to uh, rural land use change. Um, and hopefully, um, and I think our students would attest to this too, um, that we're helping people to transform um, their communities um, but also um, to deliver more broad, substantive change at a policy and then political level in a range of different contexts. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. Ben. And uh, yeah, one thing, one of the, the issue, themes that have come through in almost everybody's uh, presentations here, which as you all know, but the, the audience doesn't, that uh, I've I left Australia for 17 years and just came back, so I'm, I'm new to, to RMIT, been here about you know, five or six months. And the issue of reconciliation and, and the sophistication that I think RMIT is taking to this throughout its research and education programs and the way the institution works has really been 
a, a remarkable learning curve for me as well. And I have to say it's changed a lot in those 17 years I've been away and something that I feel very proud of in terms of the way the university is, is, is and our programs and our academic staff and professional staff are really taking this on. And I know there's a great uh, upwelling of demand from students and, and desire for students to really engage in that way as well. So it's really a, a fantastic uh, development that's happened. So now I think if we have any questions, I'm not sure if we do, um, uh, We'll see those come up um, in a moment. And if there aren't any, I will ask some, but we'll see how we go. <laughs> it's my big opportunity. Um, so while waiting to see if there are any questions, I certainly would encourage uh, the audience to, to ask any questions if you have them. I uh, just throw a question open to the panel for a discussion about what do you think actually makes a student a good fit for, for RMIT on your program. So what are, what are the qualities that you can see in your students that actually have them not only just get into the program, because that's really, that's step one, obviously, but succeed and graduate and succeed beyond graduation into those careers that Kay was talking about that but we don't know yet, uh, that are emerging and that are changing and what have you. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, does anyone want to take that? Otherwise, I'll, I'll uh, nominate. Maybe Tanya, you, would, you could actually... Uh, have a crack at that one. I can talk to some of that, Tim. Um, I guess, you know, what you've talked about in terms of um, for the careers we don't yet know um, is probably a little different for our School of Education in many of our programs relate into um, becoming school teachers in different sectors across, um, of, across the lifespan of education. Um, but in saying that, Tim, I think um, if you think about the, the, bigger, the bigger picture here about what, what are the qualities, um, obviously, you know, we're, we're looking for students with um, creative thinking, critical thinking skills, um, how they work across teams, how they relate to people. Um, I think one of the things that we share across our college, and I'd love our colleagues to talk more about that from their perspective, is um, that we have got the, you know, a lot of the humanities and, and social sciences uh, programs in our college. And if you think about that from a, from a program perspective, you know, we are looking for, for the students who really can create the change for, that we want to see in society for tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. Does anyone else want to pick up from your perspective? Like, yeah, Kate, thanks. Yeah, to sort of tag on to what Tanya was talking about, in international studies, we're definitely looking for students and overwhelmingly our students are uh, individuals who want to make a change in the world. It's it's an assumption almost in our course that um, that our students will have that desire and they may not yet know exactly how they want to achieve it, but they recognise that the world as it is is far from perfect and, and they're keen and they're interested. And I reflect sometimes on my own experience as an undergrad and, and the degree that I did where that was not a common feeling amongst our cohort, that desire wasn't there. People, some people were there just to go to uni. But um, what certainly attracted me to this degree and one of the reasons why I love teaching into it is because of that commitment um, that our students bring to it. And it's what makes it so rewarding. And I dare say it's something that's shared right across um, all the different parts of RMIT. Absolutely. So Ian, and I might say why well, Ian's getting himself off mute that uh that the RMIT is in the streets, and something I love about RMIT is actually in literally in the streets. We're not on a sequestered campus pulled away from society to ponder ponder it from a distance. We're actually in it, participating in it, making change in it, educating people for it, and so on. So uh, something I really do love about RMIT. Ian. Yeah, just to follow up on your question, Tim, I think um, I think when I think about design, I think of it as a very disruptive profession. You know, one and, and one where we drive innovation we, and we drive change. So when, what we're really looking for from students from us is, is a passion, you know, a, a real desire to make a, make a positive contribution to drive that change. And look, we, we're very aware of the sort of changing sort of professional landscape in design, all the different and expanded fields of practice that are opening up for students, um, huge amount of opportunities. For, if, you know, for, for, for a student who, or an applicant who wants to really make a positive contribution to, to the world they live in. I think I think design is a particularly good one, as is all the, all the courses that are represented here, the disciplines that are represented here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Jock. Thanks, Tim, and thanks, Ian. I better jump onto the design bandwagon here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and look, 
just to go back a step though to pick up on on both on on Kay and Tanya's points, um, it is for us it is about uh, change and wanting to change the world, having a desire to change the world. And I agree, Kay. I can't remember having that passion and desire at that age. And I'm constantly, you know, amazed and uplifted by <laughs> our students who do have that at such a young age. Um, and and really um, the then the ability, I mean, for us as uh, well as landscape architectural designers, but also um, across the school, it design comes in many forms and at many scales. So, you know, it may be, uh, as Tim suggested, we're on the street, it might just be changing the surface of the street, it might be changing the step between a, a pedestrian walkway and a, 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 a tram um, exit. Or it could be at the, you know, the global scale or the, the kind of mega city scale where we're proposing strategic directions for cities. And all of that can be encapsulated, I reckon, in, in a student coming to us with an interest and a passionate interest in the world and the ability to ask questions of that world, um, the world around them from, from you know, this immediacy of what we're in now to the, to the broader world. And that, again, is a phenomenal attribute that so many of our students have got. And it's just really an amazing thing. And that's what uh, keeps us going, I think, through these harder times possibly yeah yeah I, I agree i think great design also kind of recognizes you as a human where you are right if a, a bus kneels down to help you step into it or something like that it sort of recognizes you and your in your situation which is uh, can be a very beautiful thing ben do you have anything you wanted to add from your perspective on what yes. Makes, yep. yeah sorry uh, no, no. Uh, I think one one thing that's probably not unique to the Environment and Society program, um, but the fact that people kind of rally around something that they're really passionate and, and interested in is is a really positive thing. But I think it also, perhaps now more than ever, has has highlighted I think in a number of RMIT programs how learning is a a very collective experience sometimes, and um, I think that awareness that um, you know we learn together often and that we rely on and draw on each other as students and that um, I think that camaraderie of, of the, that willingness to support each other and to learn together and then to also recognize that beyond the degree that those connections remain really important not just from a, a career perspective but from a kind of a, a friendship and well-being perspective as well so I, I think that's probably something I've really noticed of late too that's that's been a really positive dimension right. Yeah, I was talking to a, to a friend who's fairly prominent in the sustainability and design and scholarship area, philosophy arena, Tony Fry, the other day, and he did make the point that uh, the social is actually half the sky when it comes to the future of sustainability, because we often see it as a technological, technical kind of uh, dimension, and then that ignoring the social and cultural aspects of it is, is dangerous. So the fact that you are teaching in an environment and society program, I think, is, is testament to that. Um, so thank you. Kit? Wanna, yeah. I, I mean, I, I was just going to add to that um, wonderful points made by colleagues. I couldn't agree more strongly. But Ben, if I was going to take that a step further, I think it's about our students being connected, um, you know, both to each other, the sense of community and a peer group, you know, being connected to the real world as well, whether that's, um, you know, the needs of a particular sector, uh, whether it's a particular career they want to aspire, uh, or whether it's to change, you know, to do something positive, that, that sense of connection, but also connection to themselves, you know, their own vision, their own imagination, um, their own drive. All, all of those, I think, are really critical. And, and I, I find very much uh, as um, the hallmark, if you like, of RMIT, that that sense of connections and community. I mean, we're all speaking in our separate bubbles this evening, but of course, we all have students working alongside each other, with each other, on the same industry projects to solve the big problems. And, and connection and collaboration, again, I think is an incredible feature and in why I enjoy being here. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and I think that's a really important note and maybe one that we can finish on. Um, uh, oh, I, maybe there may be some uh, questions from the audience now. Main teams windows are closed. Uh, okay, so thank you for that. I'm not quite sure. Let me just see if I can find them. I thought they were appearing there. But to your point about the social, because you know, obviously, all of 
I think it's particularly impactful to the generation of students coming through at undergraduate level right now for being, you know, the isolating uh, impact of, of COVID. Uh, but obviously, fairly soon we will be, we have been back on campus and we'll be back on campus again soon. And so I think uh, people who are looking to come to RMIT can really look forward to that sense of community and creative, the creative energy across the whole campus, uh, which is remarkable. Um, and the facilities that we have and the and the, and the halls, when you walk it full of students, there's, there's nothing like it. And as it blurs into the street, as I said before, and back, um, I think we're all yearning for that, uh, but no one more than, than the people we're talking to today uh, to, to come back together and, and remember that learning is a social endeavor, a community practice, as well as, a, as a, just a recitation of facts. So uh, we're looking forward to that uh, immensely. Maybe we're looking forward to it even more than some of the students are, because <laughs> It gets lonely in these bubbles. So, uh, uh, <laughs> so I thank you. I, if there is a question from the audience, um, it would be great to have it in the chat. I actually can't find it. Um, but uh, otherwise, I think we'll wrap it up there. I think this is a very nice note to finish on. And uh, we've um, okay. As always happens, just <laughs> you're winding it up, you get a question. Right at that moment. <laughs> Thank you very much, whoever that person was, <laughs> for asking questions. So I'm delighted. Um, can students get involved in projects or studies in, say, the School of Art if they're doing a course in another area like international studies or landscape archery? Well, yes. Interesting you should say that because that is precisely the university we are in. The, yes, you can. And we want to actually continue to build uh, on those possibilities because uh, you're singing to the choir here. I, this is something, and Tanya, I know, uh, is, is very passionate about this, as all other panelists are, that we really do want to make sure students are able to kind of access the strengths and richness of the university writ large um, mm -hmm. studies. So, yes, uh, I, uh, I think Kay and Ben might want to speak to it more specifically, because uh, actually, no, Ben and Jock more specifically, because it's about international. Uh, sorry, let me do that again. Kay and Jock. International Studies and Landscape Architecture were the questions from which they this questionnaire was asking. So Kay, can, can you take a course in art or anything else from International Studies? You're on mute. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, not working. Yeah, we can hear you, Kay. Oh, you can? Yeah, yeah. Go Fantastic. Sorry, I'm not sure what was going on there. Um, yes, I mean, we our, our program allows students to take electives from all across the university. Um, and what we find is that students have a wonderful way of connecting what they're learning in their main program with, um, with the art course. You went on mute. You were accidentally tapped mute, I think. Okay. Sorry. Sometimes that happens with your keyboard. Sorry about that. No um, so <laughs> to give you one example, um, I teach uh, a lot of feminist theory and feminist politics in my work. I teach issues uh, of uh, violence against women is one of the topics we cover. And we have many students who will take a photography course in, um, in the art school and uh, will, um, you know, integrate their learning from my course with, with their work in photography. And it's, it's wonderful to see yeah. the way in which the students apply uh, knowledge in different areas of their study. Great. Uh, that's a really good example. Thanks. And just while we have you there, Kay, and then I'll move over to Kit, um, there's another question here for you it, it, asking whether international studies is a good stepping stone to getting into politics. We've got yep. some inspiring polit politicians out there who are, are looking for a... <laughs> yep. Well, while my computer's allowing me to stay off mute, um, <laughs> It, it can be for sure, and I think it depends on how uh, the individual who's asking this question is understanding politics. Um, we have lots and lots of students who uh, are interested going directly into politics and others who are interested in the policy work of politics. Um, and so we have plenty that, uh, especially that go into the latter. Um, I had a student just uh, last semester, she was finishing her degree. Um, we were able to use some industry contacts in our program to put her in touch with um, some people who work at DFAT to help prep her for her interview. 
um, she she was successful in getting into their graduate program. So we really look to support our students uh, in furthering their careers, and we do have many who who go into um, different types of political roles. Absolutely. Great. Thanks, Kay. And Kit, do you want to speak a little bit to to people who want to come into the art program, as well as maybe some students who might want to move out of the art program and take try other things? Absolutely. I mean, and, and that, just to pick up on that point that you made, Kay, I couldn't agree more. The value of students going in both directions and learning from each other and alongside each other is one of the things that's so strong in our college. Um, <clears throat> we often have tailored uh, courses um, that support people at an entry level and then sequences where they can develop the particular skills they're interested in. Um, but I'd also point to something that I, I describe as dark curriculum which is the kind of invisible glue um, where students again might um, come together around clubs or societies or sometimes again um, what we call partner projects, projects that industry bring to us um, where they want combinations of skill sets and aptitudes. Um, so sometimes this is hardwired, sometimes it's where we respond to ideas and opportunities uh, and make it fit and, and extraordinary things are created there. Um, uh, um, but again, always welcome uh, to come through the door of the School of Art. And while we have you, Kit, um, sorry, I'll, uh, there's a question also here um, about the effects of COVID and, and whether fine art faculty are still able to assist and engage with the uh, community on a remote basis. Like how, you know, I think for most people, making art, making design is so quintessentially something you have to do in a studio. And so how have you managed that? And others might want to pick up that theme as well and other answers. So this is what we've been living every day for the last 18 months or so. Yep. Um, and, and I could talk at length, but what I would say is um, comparing notes with other deans of schools of art um, around the country, um, we've actually seen, in, in simple terms, the most uh, innovative outcomes being created by our students because they're having to work in unusual situations. Uh, I'm not saying necessarily it's better work, um, but the level of imagination discovery has been breathtaking. Um, we've certainly got very adept at um, helping students work with domestic level fabrication um, and then um, having intensive bursts of activity with specialist equipment and, in, and, and, and intensive forms of learning um, to, to bridge any gaps. Um, but I think we've seen a surge in making practices during COVID. I think knitting is again huge. Um, uh, you know, ceramics never went out of fashion. Um, you know, that, that appetite to make and create, we, we can shape that and finesse that in, in a range of ways. For me, having to work outside of the studio has just given us, forgive me, uh, another color in our palette. You know, it's another way of doing what we do. <laughs> Great, thanks, Kit. Jock, were you, were you trying to jump in there? Oh, thanks, Tim. I was just going to um, dovetail on um, Kit's earlier point about dark curriculum and, and connection, um, and and I think I think that's very important. And and yes, we we like the idea and support the idea and facilitate the idea of the plug and play approach through the schools, uh, and you know program to program and school to school. But there's also, and, and the, the way that students build those networks with us, we, we've uh, got a very active student body called uh, the Student Landscape Architecture Body, which has the unfortunate acronym of SLAB, uh, and, and do super important work in convening symposia that are an amazing prompt for the profession. Uh, and they they team up with allied uh, disciplines, but they also team up with Melbourne Uni, and so uh, the two the two stronger landscape uh, offerings. And so there's this amazing network of students that fo has kind of formed. They they form prompts to us, and then back out to the profession. And I think that's an incredibly important thing. Right. Indeed. So I think we might big start to wrap things up now. It's getting to the time. But Ben, I don't know whether you there's a question here for you in relationship to climate change and what action people, students are taking at a community level uh, to address climate change. If you have a brief answer for that, that would be fabulous. Thanks. Uh, yeah, very, very quickly, uh, very short answer to a very big question. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think one of the, the main things that I would suggest is to, to acknowledge that every community is going to be different. We could be talking about streets, we could be talking about neighbourhoods, 
very different parts of, of the city or the country or the world. I think it's about thinking about what are the needs um, in a particular place at a particular moment, bringing people together around those needs. It could be urban cooling, it could be resource use, it could be something else. And then thinking about how to address them. Is this an issue where we all come together collectively to advocate for change at a local level? Are we looking at engaging local government with grants or uh, funding? Um, but but really thinking, okay, what are the needs? Who needs to come together? How are we going, going to do that collectively? Acknowledging that there'll be dif differences amongst us, um, but there's important commonalities to be addressed as well. Fantastic, thanks. Thanks so much. So. Okay, so we'll we'll wrap things up here. Um, thank you so much for joining us, uh, everyone. Uh, mm. Special thanks to our speakers who are really wonderful, and I've learned an enormous amount as well, and I hope you have too. So if you're interested in finding out more, remember to check out the other live sessions happening on our Open Day platform throughout August, and register for the main online event on Sunday, August the 29th. You can do this by visiting openday.rmit.edu.au. And we hope to see you at RMIT soon. Thank you so much and have a good evening. Bye.